Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Deal. Thanks so much to the Space Foundation for hosting me as part of their Start Here for Space series. Today's presentation is going to be on Space Law 101. I am Jessica Deal, and I work with NASA's Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs. So a little bit about me um, and my career at NASA. I started as a Presidential Management Fellow uh, at NASA headquarters and uh, I worked with the Commercial Space Flight Program in the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. While there, I was detailed to the FAA Office of Chief Counsel. I also did a detail to support um, OSTP. And after my, uh, my fellowship ended, I moved over to NASA Goddard, where I worked at the Office of Chief Counsel. And uh, from there, I've now moved over to NASA headquarters, where I work in the Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs. So what is space law? Always a good place to start. <laughs> um, I first turned to the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs and uh, pulled up their definition. So in their words, space law can be described as the body of law governing space-related activities. Pretty straightforward. What does that mean? Um, that comprises a variety of international agreements, treaties, conventions, rules and regulations of international organizations, um, specifically the United Nations, um, and they have General Assembly resolutions. Um, space law also addresses a variety of matters. So some of the common areas include the preservation of space and Earth environments, liability for damages caused by space objects, settlements of disputes, the rescue of astronauts, sharing information about potential dangers in outer space, the use of space-related technologies, international cooperation, norms of behavior in space, and domestic laws which govern space activities. There are a number of outer space treaties. Uh, we could spend quite a long time talking about those, but since we're limiting this segment to 30 minutes, we'll, uh, we'll work on a few here. So uh, I'm gonna go through the five main treaties and then I'll go into a few in a little bit more detail. So um, we'll start with the Outer Space Treaty. And that is a treaty on the principles governing the activities uh, of various states or countries in the exploration and use of outer space, which includes the moon and other celestial bodies. One of the other treaties uh, that you should be aware of is the Rescue Agreement. Um, and this is an agreement for the rescue of astronauts. Uh, so that all countries uh, who are party to this treaty would uh, make sure to rescue and return astronauts as well as other objects that are launched into space. A um, few of the other treaties to be aware of is the Liability Convention. Uh, and that is the convention on international liability for damage caused by space objects. Another is the Registration Convention, uh, which is the Convention on the Registration of Objects Launched into Outer Space, and uh, also to discuss the Moon Agreement, which is an agreement covering the activities of states on the Moon and other celestial bodies. So going a little bit more in depth into the Outer Space Treaty, this is the primary treaty which forms the basis of international space law. There are 110 countries which have ratified and an additional 89 which have signed this treaty. Um, some important tenements of the Outer Space Treaty include prohibiting placing nuclear weapons in space, limiting the use of the moon and other celestial bodies to only peaceful purposes, establishing that space should be free for exploration and use by all nations, and that no nation may claim sovereignty of outer space or any celestial body. I draw to your attention the OST Article 3, which states that states parties to the treaty shall carry on activities in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, in accordance with international law, including the Charter of the United Nations. And the important takeaway from this particular piece of the treaty is that this extends international law into outer space. One of the other treaties that we had mentioned is the Moon Agreement. 
And uh, one important thing to note about the Moon Agreement is the fact that this has not been ratified by any spacefaring nations. Um, and so this is an agreement uh, to be aware of, but not necessarily followed. The Moon and other celestial bodies should be used exclusively for the peaceful purposes. Their environment should not be disrupted. The United Nations should be informed of the location and purpose of any station established on those bodies. The moon and its natural resources are the common heritage of mankind, and an international regime should be established to govern the exploration of such resources when such exploitation is about to become feasible. So that is uh, one of the important tenements of the moon agreement, but again, noting that that has not been ratified by the United States or other spacefaring nations. Um, in addition to the international treaties, there are fundamental principles which guide the conduct of space activity. Um, and one of the examples that I'd like to discuss today is the Artemis Accords. Um, the Artemis Accords were uh, just this past year signed by the um, first tranche of countries who joined on. That included Australia, Canada, Italy, Japan, Luxembourg, UAE, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Um, more recently, we've had signed on countries including South Korea, New Zealand, and Brazil. The Artemis program um, is NASA's initiative to land the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. Um, and you know, NASA is leading the Artemis program in the United States, but our international partnerships are going to play a key role to achieve a sustainable and robust presence on the moon and preparing to conduct historic human missions to Mars. So for all those partners who want to join us in uh, our exploration of the moon and on to Mars, and to be part of the Artemis program, we're asking that they join us in signing the Artemis Accords and uh, agreeing to these common principles. So what are those principles? I'm gonna walk through them. Um, and you can also find out more about these on the uh, NASA webpage. But the first uh, tenement of the NASA Accords is that these are for peaceful purposes. So our international cooperation is going to bolster space exploration, enhance peaceful relationships between nations, um, and we're looking to explore in a peaceful purpose. Uh, that is one of the tenements of the Outer Space Treaty that we talked about before, so it's extending that a bit further. Another key principle is transparency. Um, we believe that transparency is a key principle for responsible civil space exploration. And NASA has always uh, worked to be as transparent as possible. And we're asking that our partner nations um, uphold the principle of transparency by publicly describing their own policies and plans um, and asking us to join them in that tenement here. Uh, one of the other elements is interoperability. Um, interoperability of systems is critical to ensure safe and robust space exploration. Um, so this one I think about a little bit like uh, your phone charger. Uh, if you all have different types of phones, the chargers don't necessarily work for every one of them. Um, and it's the same in space. So if we can work to a um, a uniform system, then it'll allow for more actors to join us and for all of us to be able to uh, work together a little bit more easily. Uh, one of the other elements is emergency assistance. So uh, this would be to provide emergency assistance to those in need, um, which we believe is a cornerstone of any responsible civil space, space program. Um, this is reaffirming our commitment to the agreement of the rescue of astronauts, one of those other international treaties we talked about earlier, um, and also the return of objects launched into outer space. One of the additional elements is the registration of space objects. This is at the core of creating a safe and sustainable environment uh, to conduct public and private activities. So without proper registration, it's difficult to avoid harmful interference. So we want to know where all the objects are in space uh, so that 
the United States and other countries are not only aware of where they are, but able to then avoid them. The release of scientific data. Um, NASA has always been committed to the timely, full and open sharing of scientific data. And we're asking our Artemis Accord partners to follow that example and agree to release their scientific data publicly to ensure that the whole world is benefiting for our journey into space and our exploration. Protecting heritage. So we have some heritage sites on the moon. One example would be the um, first US moon landing, the footprint that's there, that would be um, something that we would deem to be a historic site and an artifact. And we want to make sure that those sites are preserved. So we are gonna work to protect those and uh, we ask that our partners do the same. Space resources. So the ability to extract and utilize resources um, on the moon, on Mars, and on asteroids is critical to support safe and sustainable space exploration and development. Um, in order for folks to live and work on the moon and eventually Mars, uh, we will need to provide them with various elements that can be extracted and used to enable. Uh, the deconfliction of activities. So uh, we talked a little bit about avoiding harmful interference, which was one of the tenements of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and that is further implemented by the Artemis Accords. And what that means is that both NASA and partner nations are agreeing to provide public information uh, regarding the location, the nature of operation, and information on the scale and scope of what we call safety zones. Um, so this would allow us to deconflict our activities with other partner nations. Um, orbital debris and spacecraft disposable. Preserving a safe and sustainable environment in space is critical for both the public and private activities. And as such, we're agreeing to plan for the mitigation of orbital debris, including safe, timely, and efficient um, preservation and disposal of the spacecraft at the end of their missions. In addition to uh, the international treaties and norms, as we uh, talked about up front, there are many states that have national legislation that govern space-related activities. And a few examples of uh, some of those activities in the United States include government contracts, grants, cooperative agreements, Space Act agreements, the U.S. Commercial Space Launch and Competitiveness Act. NASA authorization bills, and NASA appropriations. Uh, so starting with the U.S. Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act, um, this allows U.S. industry to engage in the commercial exploration and exploitation of space resources. It asserts that the United States does not assert sovereignty or sovereign or exclusive rights or jurisdiction over the ownership of any celestial body. So again, going back to those tenements of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, NASA authorizations. So uh, an authorization act is a law that establishes or continues one or more federal agencies or programs, establishes the terms and conditions under which they operate, authorizes the enactment of appropriations, and specifies how appropriated funds are to be used. Authorization acts sometimes provide permanent appropriations. Um, so what does that mean? In practice, an authorization act does two things. One, it sets the amounts that NASA may spend for its programs. And two, it sets policy for the agency. NASA authorization activity. So most recently, uh, in May, the Senate committee passed uh, the Endless Frontier Acts, which included the 2021 NASA Authorization Act as an amendment. Um, and so we are hopeful that that bill will uh, continue to move through the Hill and that we will have an agreed on um, NASA Authorization Act this year. Uh, in contrast to authorizations, NASA appropriations are passed every year. Uh, NASA's budget for FY21 was $23.3 
And in the appropriations, it, there includes an explanatory statement accompanying Congress appropriation legislation, which provides uh, funding and policy direction. And so, um, as we briefly mentioned, the authorizations uh, give that uh, policy direction, and then the appropriations provide the funding. So working together, our appropriators and our authorizers work very closely on the Hill um, to work with uh, all of the agencies, but in this case with NASA, um, in order to uh, provide direction and guide funding and programs for uh, the year and years ahead. That is a brief summary of uh, both the international and uh, a few national legislation uh, elements of space law. Thank you again to the Space Foundation for hosting me, and I hope you enjoy the other videos as a part of the Start Here for Space series. Mm -hmm.